Hello everyone, this is Eva Nordic smith with Yoga You Online and I'm very excited to be here today with Dr. Ginger Garner who joins us to talk about common postpartum health issues and the potential role yoga might play in helping new mothers either prevent or relieve postpartum problems. Um, Ginger is a physical therapist, yoga therapist, and an author of the recently released book uh, called Medical Therapeutic Yoga. And for the last 25 years, Ginger's medical career has focused on using yoga as therapy and training healthcare professionals to use yoga for both medical uses and for self-care. Ginger is the founder of Professional Yoga Therapy Institute, which is an international interdisciplinary medical yoga therapy certification specifically targeting health care professionals. So Ginger, you're essentially a teacher of physical therapists, occupational therapists, doctors, nurses, is that correct? Yes, anybody that falls within the medical realm. And of course, you know, for what we're about to talk about, um, our audience will be uh, a range of those people, which could include yoga professionals too. Yeah. Yeah. And your clinical specialties include hip and pelvic health, pain management, and injury prevention, mm -hmm. uh, with a special emphasis on women's health. And Ginger lives in the U.S. with her husband and three sons, which somehow or other along the way she had <laughs> time to fit in. <laughs> yeah. so, so Ginger, welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. So um, let us start out just um, what inspired your interest in using yoga in your career and also tell us about um, the book that came out of this work, which I believe just got published recently with, uh, is it Handspring Publishing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The great, the great folks at Handspring. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess the, to tackle the first part of the question, um, it all started <laughs> way back when, about, well, it was 20 years ago now, um, in physical therapy school. For me, yoga had come prior to uh, my licenses in athletic training and physical therapy. So by the time I got to PT school, I'd been practicing yoga for a while. And my main concern when I got to, to school at, at UNC Chapel Hill um, was, and this was a literal question, and I remember saying it out loud almost immediately within the first few months of being there, is where's the preventive context? Hmm. Where's the wellness-based, public health-oriented education that already had been working in sports medicine for several years, covering Division I athletes at the university and high school athletes? So I already saw what happens when you don't get proper care on the front end. Mm -hmm. If you're a 15-year-old and you have an ACL, you know, tear or a rotator cuff problem as a baseball player, and you're and you're and you're just a kid in high school. Um, so that was what thrust the 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 yoga to the forefront for me because I saw that as as a way to address some of the things that now in in a lot of PT schools and in medical schools they're beginning to address more prevention. But we're so encased in the biomedical model in only being able to fix the broken because that's all insurance will pay for. <laughs> they won't pay for the other side that we find ourselves forced down that, you know, direction and I think it could take several generations before we actually get to operate in the optimal system that we would like, which is a preventive model. Mm -hmm. So that's when I begin to to um, focus in more on yoga as a way to to deliver PT. But the turning point for me was when I was in my first year of practice, um, literally head down, working with a patient in chronic pain um, with women's health issues. She was um, post hysterectomy. In other words, she was one of those moms that even though her kids were in their 30s, she was still acutely postpartum with mm -hmm. a lot of issues that could have been prevented. So I'm head down working with her. Um, and as a therapist, you get to spend so much time with your patients mm -hmm. that um, it becomes, uh, you're very driven emotionally to help them too. 
And you have to take care not to take too much of that on. But for me, um, that was my passion and what fueled me. And I looked up from seeing her working with her and she was driving three hours round trip just to see me because access to PT was poor and further uh, more access to specialized PT was even less, you know, accessible, especially in the area that I work in, which is an underserved lower income area. Mm -hmm. So to, to well, so there's people I looked up, I said, you know what, everybody on my schedule is in chronic pain and most of them are women and most of this could have been prevented. And further, the things that I am using, I'm taking, I was, I am taking yoga and interject, injecting it into physical therapy and it evolves into, well, really what my book became and what just came out. And and I looked up and said that, and that's when I made kind of a distinct choice to move outside of the typical conventional setting so that I, in order to be able to help those women. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what kind of led me up to today, uh, where I am today. That was around 98, 1998, and that's really when I started to put pen to paper and say, I... I don't see a lot of yoga being used. Um, at the time, I opened a, a clinical practice, um, was probably one of the first ones in the United States and maybe all over that was integrating those two things together. Um, so I started to put pen to paper to kind of manifest, how would I teach this to other therapists? How would I teach this to other healthcare providers? It works so well. And it works so efficiently. I can see mm -hmm. them in less visits. Mm -hmm. um, their satisfaction is higher. Um, their pain is well managed. Um, it's costing them less because I was able to see them in a different model, not the typical healthcare you know model we get wrapped up in, where mm -hmm. copays are high, deductibles are high, and mm -hmm. it's hard to see those people. So. Um, that is really what led to the birth of the book, and the book was just published in the fall last fall which is actually an interactive um, multimedia book of sorts. There are codes that are scannable that give you access to um, a couple of dozen free videos throughout the book that explain some of the principles that I'm teaching face-to-face, um, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's important for people who need that visual and learn mm -hmm. in that way. So yeah. I felt that it could be um, of assistance to a lot of people to have that component. So that's a little bit about bio and birth of the book, um, the short story. <laughs> right, right, right. Is it focused uh, specifically on uh, women's health issues or it's broad? Um, yeah, it, it is. Um, the funny thing about that is I thought I would actually write a book for women's health first, right. particularly postpartum, prenatal postpartum because that's always been my driving passion is to, to help those women who seem to fall off the radar or get dropped by the system of care. Uh, but it turned out that I ended up writing the general book first. So it's a, a broad book that introduces yoga um, to healthcare professionals and really anybody who wants to learn about uh, the science and the art of yoga and how to interpret um, a large part of the book is how we can interpret and um, design movement for people within the context of asana that's safe and effective mm. for people. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Now, um, you you made reference to you know basically the thing that inspired you to embark down this path of integrating yoga was working with a woman who had postpartum issues 10 years down the road from having given birth and it's an interesting thing that you mentioned that there seems to be a gap there where women fall through the gap or through the um, you know kind of don't really get the care and I think we have in society you know this image that giving birth is you know one of the most important and wonderful events in a woman's life and you give birth you have your baby and you know that's where the story ends, and you start rearing the, your kids, and everything right. is wonderful from there on. Except, um, you know, you may have some problems dealing with the kids from time to time, but we never hear about, you know, women having ongoing postpartum issues, 
for three, five, even 10, 12 years down the road? Mm -hmm. the, that's probably talking about epidemiology and there are risks um, and incidences mm -hmm. of problems in the postpartum is, is one of the things I probably get the most fired up about uh, as far as what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, because if you look at some of the statistics, they, they should be nothing short of alarming. Mm -hmm. If we speak about the United States, let's just take the United States. We have the highest, um, postpartum, um, first day infant death rate, just talking about, um, infant, um, uh, mortality and also more maternal mortality. So more women and their babies die first day in the United States than any other industrialized nation. We have no standards of postpartum care in the United States. So if you, and this, this now extends beyond just the United States. So if we look at some of the statistics, um, let's say in Ireland, uh, one study in 2014 looked at about 872 women at 15 weeks postpartum and one year postpartum. And at one year, 73% of them had urinary incontinence. 49% yeah. of them had fecal incontinence. 14% um, had pelvic organ prolapse. 58%, which is a high number and more than is acceptable, has had sexual dysfunction that continued to persist at one year postpartum. And of all of those different diagnoses, more than 71% of those women had multiple diagnoses. So they were had sexual dysfunction and a prolapse or sexual dysfunction and incontinence. You combine those things together, and I think the reason they're not being reported is because we don't have any standards of care internationally. Before our, inter our interview today, I looked at statistics in, in Europe in general, in Turkey, in the US, Sweden, Israel, Ireland, all over the world. And I think that for the most part, with the exception of France, they do have an eight week postpartum physical therapy program. With the exception of France, there are no standards of postpartum care. So a lot of women think that that's just the way it is after they give birth. Mm -hmm. And it's also embarrassing, right? For women to say, oh, I, I'm, I'm leaking. Or even worse, if it's fecal incontinence. And then if it's combined with sexual dysfunction. I've had more patients than not of mine come to me um, postpartum and say that when they tried to tell their caregiver, whether it was a midwife, physician, et cetera, um, they were having problems with, with intercourse or sexual dysfunction in general, um, they were often told to drink a glass of wine and relax. <laughs> And I hate to even say that because there are lots of OBGYNs and midwives who would be equally appalled by that statement. But those are the things that patients come in and, and share mm -hmm. and say. Um, and to be able to help them through that and realize and, and, and let them know, which is a, a big piece of education, is that it is common, but it sh it's not normal, right? right and it's right. not something that you have to suffer with and put up with, and it's not just the way it is because your mom or your grandmother had the same thing, um, and they didn't get any help either. Yeah. So we, there's a lot of hope in it, but there's a lot of work for us to do too. A, clinical work, work in yoga and yoga therapy, and also policy work uh, in order to right. change things. Right, right. I, I wonder if part of it is that there is simply a lack of um, knowledge of therapies that could help. So tell us a little bit about the mechanics of why these things happen. What are the changes in the body that happen that predispose women for incontinence, prolapse, sexual dysfunction, or, um, you know, just generalized pelvic pain. And what as a yoga therapist or physical therapist do you see as a path towards resolving those issues? Mm -hmm. Well, there are many risk factors. Um, I think the first thing that may be a myth is that having a C-section prevents you from having some of those problems. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the literature and reviews of literature, that isn't really the case. Mm -hmm. There are some instances where, and this is um, more, uh, more, a more obscure fact, is that um, in this 
particular study I was looking at, um, women had with C-sections may have reported increased um, sexual satisfaction and less dysfunctional issues. Um, and women who had vaginal births um, had a slightly increased risk uh, or, prev or incidence um, of reporting um, that feeling of um, bulging in the perineum, which could be a pelvic organ prolapse, et cetera. But overall, um, by and large, mm -hmm. um, C-section versus is not going to protect you from, say, um, urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse necessarily. So some of the risk factors that go along with that um, are not really vaginal birth necessarily, but it's the weight gain that happens. Yeah. Um, moms who start out with a higher body mass index um, in the beginning or may gain more weight during pregnancy, um, there needs to be a lot of education on um, healthy eating and, and food choices, which mm -hmm. can also affect orthopedic health and gastrointestinal health, not mm -hmm. just weight, body weight. Mm -hmm. um, other risk factors are moms with... Um, multiple pregnancies and births. Mm -hmm. And and most women go on to have uh, more than one child. And um, the vast majority, I believe over 86% of women, do give birth. So while most women do have more than one child, that also increases their risk each time. Um, for example, the, the uh, risk of diastasis rectus abdominis, which is that splitting of the abdominals um, at the linea alba, is 100% in pregnancy, which basically means you're not getting out of having that split in the abdominal uh, abdominal um, region of the linea alba, that it's going to happen. What's profound about it is when you look at some of the studies that are out there, um, if that's, say, one of the 100% um, incidences is DRA, then we can say every woman would need assistance with that. And when we look at the, the scientific uh, literature, um, at eight weeks, it doesn't resolve. So if at eight weeks, that DRA hasn't spontaneously resolved for, for women, and most don't, then they go on to develop um, other issues related to that, which could be incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, sexual mm. dysfunction, pelvic girdle pain, um, just pelvic floor dysfunction in general. Um, so it's important that you could see then what some... Uh, how beneficial screening would be just yeah. if someone's coming into a, a, a yoga class postpartum. And as I've heard some of my colleagues say, and I always say this too, um, you know, once postpartum, always postpartum until we resolve those issues that are definitely going to exist. You may not suffer from incontinence, but that risk increases also not just with weight gain during pregnancy and the weight gain of pregnancy mm -hmm. itself, but also with age. So with every decade, we are our risk is increasing of having any of those number of um, kind of litany of diagnoses and conditions mm -hmm. that I listed, mm -hmm. which isn't hopeless. It just means that we need more attention, yes. that women's health can be improved, and that with a little bit of effort, um, that we can prevent um, a, a lot of issues that would naturally just kind of snowball. Yeah. Um, so well, I believe. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, it is interesting because it's almost any area of life. If you, it's like we should have been born with an owner's manual to the body, right? It's like <laughs> a lifelong process figuring out how to handle the body and work with it in a way that enhances your health. And of course, anyone with an aging body, which all of us have, know that it's an ongoing process. Um, but it's interesting, this, um, you know, spotlight you're putting on the process of birth and the, and the changes that happen in the woman in a woman's body, and I'm just curious about the mechanics of. You were mentioning diastasis rectus abdominis um, having a 100% incident uh, rate among women giving birth. So, um, just for people who are not familiar with rectus abdominis, we're talking about the six pack muscle, the central muscle of the body. And so you're saying that that basically splits in open mm -hmm. in half. Is that during pregnancy, at the last stages of pregnancy? Um, That's a good question. Um, as far as the occurrence of that, um, I think the important thing to know is it also happens in men. 
So men mm-hmm. don't get away with <laughs> um, you know, impacts on aging too. And a lot of that it has to do with weight and abdominal mm-hmm. girth, mm-hmm. Uh, basic strength and stability and the ability to be able to move functionally um, in a safe way. So I think that for DRA, it depends on, did they have that, a pre-existing issue mm-hmm. of that? I found that, well, particularly just speaking personally, with all three of my births, all three of my babies all had a DRA too. Mm. That could have been hormonally driven. And I heard that from some pediatricians. Oh, yeah, yeah, most of them have that. And it does resolve. Uh, My last one had um, an umbilical hernia and a DRA on top of that, which some women also have. So I think there's an interesting hormonal connection there, which says, Um, depending on the spacing between pregnancies, the number of pregnancies that a mom had, or the the trauma that she her body could have endured or mm-hmm. the status of her body prior to pregnancy means DRA can happen anywhere along the spectrum. Now mm-hmm. for a lot of moms, I think it, it does have to do again with abdominal girth and and as babies growing, there's just no more space remaining and then things right. have to you know, you know yeah. artificially mechanically create some more space. And you're But saying it, if it hasn't resolved at, at, Eight weeks after giving birth, it can give rise to these other problems like incontinence and prolapse. What's the mechanism for that spillover effect? I'm just curious. Um, that's one thing that I think there could be more research in. And unfortunately, women's health issues are rather poorly researched, mm-hmm. um, perhaps because there's been inequity or an, um, a, a lack of... Um, Um, wanting to interrupt that biological uh, season of life where women um, weren't historically, um, ethically, we didn't want to research that, right? We wanted Mm -hmm. to leave it as it is biologically because uh, women were considered, um, you know, fragile. We're the nurturers of the next generation. But that's led to a problem where our issues are not as well researched as they could be. So as far as the connection between DRA and other issues, I do believe that that changes the, if you look at the abdominal region as just, and this is oversimplifying, but just as a simple cylinder or a canister, and part of that is split open on one side, all of the structures, which aren't just muscles, it, but the skin also, and the underlying fascia and enveloping fascia, And within that is invested uh, the vascular structures and the neural structures that all say, hey, wait a second. You know, re- re- they go, they go, um, you know, wait, really? I'm just <laughs> I'm just supposed to act normally when I've got all of this length tension changes. Yeah. And then as the cylinder, you know, length tension changes, the intra-abdominal pressure has to shift somewhere. Mm-hmm. And when you look at women with pelvic floor dysfunction, if you just ask them to do a straight leg raise, they actually don't activate, the, the pelvic floor is not activated like it would be in women without pain and without mm-hmm. dysfunction. Mm-hmm. So what happens is um, it can be a chicken and an egg issue, whether there was pain or whether there was just you know the mechanical or fascial dysfunction, whatever it may be. Um, or we could talk about pain neuroscience too, which is the whole other um, can of worms there. Um, the vascular structures, the neural structures do respond. So that can lead to, to other issues like mm-hmm. pelvic floor dysfunction, um, mm-hmm. incontinence, because of it could start with a mechanical issue that, that can snowball into something else. Mm-hmm. But then again, we have to look at the history of the woman also and, mm-hmm. and discuss with her, which is why interviewing is just so important, just to sit down and say, You know, what kind of problems did you have before? Did you ever have any back pain or SI joint pain mm-hmm. or pubic symphysis pain before? And and what happened with that? And what kind of treatment did you get? And I find that in seeing, in, in being in PT practice for um, 20 years now, I find that they usually didn't get the care that they needed. And sometimes they've gone not just two years, but five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years And then you finally see them. That's mm-hmm. really hard to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's just a, a plethora of, of reasons, you know, causative um, variables that we could discuss. And I'm hoping that um, through the the webinar series and practice that I'll be doing for Yoga You online, I can help introduce yoga professionals to um, that um, kind of Rolodex or litany of issues that can happen 
not just postpartum, but carry on until they're into their prenatal phase again and back into the other preg- other pregnancies and, mm-hmm. and then begin to snowball. It's important that we identify those things. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of early intervention. So if we can mm-hmm. teach more people to value early intervention and to screen mm-hmm. for that, um, that help, that's a win-win for everyone. Yeah. And I know in the back of a lot of people's minds, it is in the forefront of my mind as a healthcare provider, what's going to happen with healthcare. Well, if we had a magic (laughs) glass or crystal um, ball, that that would really be helpful, particularly right now. But we don't. I think the best thing that we can do is to continue to be proactive and continue to uh, open up a a field of, of dialogue between healthcare providers who may who may be forced to operate in a biomedical model, and yoga professionals who may have more flexibility with respect to prevention. They may see 40 or 50 women come through their yoga studio you know, in a day with classes. The educational piece is how we can change healthcare from the ground up. And I think that's mm-hmm. one of the ways that we talk about you know, politics or policy, that that can be just as a single individual one way that one yoga studio owner one yoga teacher can actually impact policy and positively improve healthcare for the future yeah that's beautiful now we talked about the physical problems related to giving birth um, but one of the things that we see fairly often in the media is discussions about postpartum depression Mm-hmm. Is that something that uh, that you work with as well and that's affected by the work you do? Absolutely. That is probably the biggest truth bomb that we can drop uh, to, to media, to everyone who uses yoga for postpartum or prenatal. Um, just it is pervasive. And even after I talk about, because I teach 32 hours on this, so... I can talk and talk and talk and talk about it, but I get to a point in um, my lectures when I'm teaching that I ask, so we've got all of these pelvic pain and pelvic girdle issues, but what's the biggest risk for women with the highest incidence? And it's postpartum depression. Not, not maybe not necessarily the, a major depressive, you know, treatment resistant depressive disorder, although yes, it can include that. It can just be feelings of, uh, you know, depressive feelings um, that would lead to postpartum depression. And there are such huge risk factors. And in fact, women who do suffer from postpartum depression, which now um, studies are showing, it's not immediately postpartum a higher risk for postpartum depression, even though that risk is still high and it's increasing in the US in the last 30 years, our risk Mm -hmm. for postpartum depression. It's actually when children are toddlers and middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. So this goes way out beyond what we thought to be true, um, you know, even five years ago, you know, much less 10 years Mm -hmm. ago, is that postpartum depression isn't isolated to that. And it's, it's, it's heavy. It's a it's a labor intensive, exhausting, you know, the neonate newborn um, time span. I've done it three times, so I know exactly what it feels like. Um, but it also allows me to, with experience, say to moms that come in, I know what you feel. I feel like I understand. Do I know every circumstance? No, but I've had three. And whether or not I had full-blown postpartum depression, I think every mom feels and, and questions themselves, am I okay? Mm-hmm. Am I getting enough support? I know I'm not getting enough sleep. And that mm-hmm. already affects systems health and is one of the things I'll mention in the webinar. But postpartum depression is so overwhelmingly important as a psychosocial aspect of the whole biopsychosocial model um, that it, it would be important to, we, we'd be very neglectful if we did not include a particular component of um, what to look for. There isn't really a profession other than the American Academy of Pediatrics right now that recommends screening for postpartum depression. So this may mm-hmm. raise a few eyebrows, and it mm-hmm. certainly may be different in England or you know in Australia, but right now in the United States, um, the the current information, the last information I have from the ACOG is that, yes, it's an issue, but it doesn't seem to be a huge issue, so they don't recommend screening for postpartum depression. 
Interesting. But American Ap- Academy of Pediatrics does. But then we have to think about this from a really practical perspective. Mom brings baby in, you know, or dad, mom or and or dad brings baby in for that checkup and you have the pediatrician and the threat of social services breathing down your neck if you check a box that says I've thought of harming myself or I've thought of so there's a whole lot of pressure on women to to lean in and be okay mm-hmm. and and I think oftentimes we do lie about it mm-hmm. you know we we fib about it and say oh no I'm fine mm-hmm. but are we really okay so I, I think that's an important um, aspect of one that goes far beyond um, what we can talk about in this time frame, but we definitely can't ignore postpartum depression. And I think that um, awareness is also key here that we get the word out and, and help moms realize they, they don't have to do it all. And, mm. uh, and we're there to, to listen and help them get the support they need. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'd imagine just the sheer effect of exhaustion. Yeah. <laughs> will, I mean, anyone will get depressed if they get exhausted. It's I don't know if it's in even necessarily a hormonal component, but just the fact that women get overworked. It's, it's complicated. One one last thing that I would like to say is that I've lived in, like I said, an underserved kind of isolated area where it's difficult for, for people to get care. And what I have seen as a result of that are people who are in not just a little bit of pain, but a lot of chronic pain their whole lives. And there are two major populations that I have seen here in the area that I live in, in eastern North Carolina, where the biggest military bases in the world are, are military Mm -hmm. service members and moms. Mm -hmm. And they can come back from combat and come out of birth presenting similarly with, yeah. (laughs) So we have to sit with that for a second and go, Wow, is our healthcare system really failing military service members and moms in the same way that the trauma that they are experiencing in birth? Because birth is incredibly traumatic in the U.S. still. Um, aside from if you have a, a the birth you want, you know, a lot of women don't feel like they had um, options explained to them, um, and it's very traumatic, traumatizing for them. So the process, that process, and the, the uh, of uh, trauma that they're undergoing, they they come out of that and present with fibromyalgia and chronic pain and chronic fatigue mm-hmm. and major depressive disorder, and the list just goes on and on, which gives me chills when mm-hmm. I talk about it. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the day I made that realization, but the day I did was... Um, a profound one for me because I felt like none of us can afford to be quiet or silent. We have to speak up about better care for moms, which also goes for military. And then how about moms in the military? They have a double, they have a double or tri- triple whammy. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Very beautiful point. And, um, just as a last question, we've sort of been, uh, walking around uh, this topic of yoga and how it helps. Uh, But talk about that, how you use yoga in your practice and why yoga, why not just physical therapy? Mm, Yeah, that's that's probably where most people start, whether they start on the yoga end or whether they start on the healthcare provider end. Um, I think that once we can come out of those silos of practice and say, oh, this will just work, right? Mm-hmm. PTs can do that. Just for example, dry needling um, versus acupuncture or manual therapy versus what we do in PT versus chiropractic. If we come out of those silos and say, well, how about, what about, or in the very least, can we combine these two things together? I think that we always come out better. Mm-hmm. I would love to see more research done where PT and yoga are combined together and researched because right now it seems like a lot of the research pits one, you know, thing against the other, like whether it's chiropractic care or PT care or a treatment for low back pain for this, you know, versus, versus the other, if we could, um, evolve that. And that's to a large extent, what the book does is, um, present a methodology for a way that we could actually do that and say, Hey, if we work together, this can be much more effective. So I started from a point of um, 
And I may not have been e ever able to work in a vacuum of just PT since yoga came first and then sports medicine came after that. I was always influenced by those things. And maybe, yeah, a little biased by yoga, certainly. Um, but if I just tried to just, uh, let's just use manual therapy, for example, because I'm an orthopedic therapist, I see a ton of back pain. <laughs> I was going to say a lot, but I'll just go right for the uh, hyperbole and use uh, a ton. Lots of back pain, lots of um, pelvic pain. I wouldn't be able to just use one modality, you know, and have it be effective. I may use in the context of a session, uh, manual therapy or whether it's uh, needling or um, soft tissue work, but without a doubt, through veined through the entire session is that biopsychosocial approach that um, the World Health Organization has always been advocating for us to use, but also the ancient disciplines and systems of medicine have as well, from tra traditional Chinese medicine to Ayurvedic medicine and yoga. Um, and it's just a privilege to be able to weave those th two things together, especially when you see the faces of your patients when they leave. And you know that in just a few sessions versus a lot of sessions, they're much, much better. Um, mm -hmm. So I would encourage yoga professionals con to consider that too, that when they have something that they're stumped with or they know is way, way, way outside of the realm of what they're comfortable with or what they should be doing, um, there are a lot of healthcare professionals out there that are embracing and using yoga now. And what a powerful way to change healthcare is to, for everyone to come together and, and work harmoniously. Yeah, that's beautiful. And um, did your, you have a course on your view online, as we made reference to, on yoga for postpartum issues. So tell us about the course and what is contained in that, what people will learn. Okay. Well, um, the funny part is when I get questions like that, I want to have an outline in front of me because I never, <laughs> I never want to miss a single detail about what's actually going to be in the course, but I'll do my best to pull from my memory. Um, I've been teaching prenatal and postpartum maternal health uh, work, also childbirth education too, for quite some time really since the birth of my first son, when I realized that, wow, the bi biomedical model really could use yoga's help here. <laughs> <laughs> bringing um, yoga into healthcare and evolving it per the evidence base, per science. So in this course, I do want to talk about evidence-based care and practice. What the current outlook is, and as I alluded to earlier, our current standards of care and outcomes in the US are pretty much the worst of any industrialized nation. But I could quote, and in front of me I have um, statistics from Turkey, uh, Israel, India, the UK, Ireland, et cetera. Um, the statistics worldwide are not that great. The prevalence and risk of postpartum issues are up there, as high as 80%, and with DRA, it's every woman you know, that gives birth won't um, be able to escape that. So I wanna talk about what the the current outlook is what current trends are um, there's a host of issues that we need to address from urinary incontinence fecal incontinence pelvic floor dysfunction in general which can encompass all of those things um, like sexual dysfunction and prolapse um, to be able to shine a spotlight on those things and say unfortunately they are very common more common than they should be um, but they're definitely not normal and in biomedical care, I think that the topics have been taboo for a little too long, so much so that women have, have more than accepted it as normal. And it's kind of like when women rose up in the 1970s and said, hey, where are our midwives? We want midwives back in the, de the delivery room um, helping us, women helping women give birth. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing needs to happen po with postpartum care, not just in the United States, but everywhere. So my aim and passion and goal would be to empower every yoga professional or healthcare professional, whatever they are, with a skill set to be able to say, hey, I can make a difference, whether I'm teaching a class or whether I'm seeing an individual um, client in a session, maybe as a yoga therapist, or whether I'm seeing a patient or I'm responsible for a whole floor of, you know, postpartum um, um, obstetric and gynecological patients in a hospital. So that's that's kind of in a nutshell yeah. what's in the course. 
And then, of course, we'll have the practice as well afterwards, which will give some very practical tips. I'm uh, a big stickler for biomechanical safety, so I do want to talk about things like uh, protecting and preserving the hip. Moms are at a really high, much higher risk for hip labral tears, um, cartilage tears. And we definitely can prevent those. And I'll be talking a little bit about that too. Mm-hmm. And, how it, and how yoga posture should look based on what moms need. Yeah. And will you be able to um, cover some of the things women can do uh, before giving birth to prevent some of these issues or reduce the chance that they may occur? Right. You know, the beautiful thing is, and I've probably said this a thousand times too, probably more, is that the very things that um, we often use to assess a problem are the, th- the same things that we will use to manage it. Mm-hmm. And that, that it covers a continuum of things which can be done. As a clinician, um, I am honestly bombarded with scientific literature, right? The ability to keep up with every research study that comes out feel makes you feel like you're like underwater like this right Right, right. and so my chief goal when I am teaching you know as an instructor and designing just a simple powerpoint or a practice is to streamline that decision making for people not to make it complicated and make their head explode with a bunch of statistics but bring it to um, a nucleus of a take-home message that we can function safely and effectively and actually make the process um, more simple. And on the underneath, there's all this other information. And that's what I'll present in, in you know, the, the webinars. Yeah. Um, but what applies prenatally often does apply postpartum as well. So they'll be able to use that skill set across the continuum. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Well, Ginger, thank you so much for joining us today. This is really absolutely fascinating information. And um, I can't even begin to touch upon how just how important it is. Um, I think, you know, just pointing to this problem that doesn't seem to be on the radar of the medical profession and um, right to say that such a huge percentage of women end up with problems five, 10, even 20 years down the road is just mind boggling. It is. And it's, I think now time more than ever, particularly with, um, the you know social and political climate that we're in now that we can make a difference by creating and the word you said is so important awareness right. creating awareness is often 90 percent of the problem if we yeah. can if every yoga professional that ends up taking the course goes back into their communities and their hometowns and affects even 50 women in that hometown. And then those women tell their friends and, you know, their daughters and their nieces, hey, that's not normal. You need to, there's help for that. Um, Whether it's going to get yoga or yoga therapy or whether it's a medical form uh, of therapeutic yoga where a PT or an OT or an MD may be delivering it. Mm -hmm. There's so much that we can do. It's, um, I get excited. So I'm glad to talk about it. I'm really glad to be teaching and being able to impact um, so many people through yoga university. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us and everyone listening in. Thanks for uh, joining us for the call today. And uh, we hope to see you on Ginger's course. Take care. Yes. Bye-bye.